verses of the Amazing Grace. It's, uh, I, don't know, I don't even know what verses you have in there. But we'll sing some verses. You'll know. You'll look out. Yeah. Just figure out the tune. Yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Rome. Rome was a bit like today's Washington, D.C. or Brussels. It was this, this power. You just breathe the fight for power in the air. Then last week, we talked about Corinth, which was a little bit like Las Vegas for how rowdy it was. It was a little bit like London for its diversity. Today, we have Ephesus which is a combination maybe of Silicon Valley and Paris. It was a technological wonder of the ancient world, and it was a, a place where artists and cosmopolitans would come. For instance, what do we know about this little ancient town? Well, they had central heating in their community center. They had a community center. They had central heating in it. Dennis back there, uh, the food pantry in the community center, it still uses space heaters, so that's one for Ephesus, zero for Nettleton. That's what we're keeping track of. Um, they also had, this is a weird stat, but they had the largest ovens of any city in the ancient world, which seems meaningless, but what that meant is that there were a lot of big mansions, a lot of rich people in Ephesus. What that also means is uh, churches didn't have buildings like this at the beginning of the church. They met in homes. And so what you had in those ancient times was uh, crossing these boundaries that are so hard to cross, right, of wealthy people, regular people, poor people, all coming together for dinner in these big places, which could be a beautiful thing. Um, you know, our oven in the church still thinks it's like 8.30 in the morning. I don't know how to fix it, so that's two for Ephesus, zero for Nettle. Uh Third, Ephesus had one of the most remarkable water systems in the world. They had a really dirty river that eventually silted up so much the harbor that you couldn't bring ships in into it, and that just killed the city. And so to get good water, they had this really elaborate system of uh, water to get there. My well pump has, has crapped out twice, and I still can't even drink the water because of all the mining tailings, so... Ephesus 3, Netherlands 0. Uh, certainly the place had farms, it had bars, it had poverty, it had regular people. Uh, but uh, Mark Antony, you know he went to, to Egypt to steal Cleopatra. Where do you think he stopped on his way? Ephesus. He wanted to go have a little visit there and you know, sun himself a little bit before going down there. And King Ptolemy, one of the King Ptolemies, um, he retired there. And artists and poets would write about Ephesus and how beautiful it was. Some people loved the fact that this city had one of the greatest libraries in ancient times. It wasn't as big as Alexandria, but it was the largest one in the northern, the entire northern uh, Mediterranean, larger than the libraries of Rome. Uh, some people love that it had a 25,000-person amphitheater. Uh, we talked about the Colosseum in Rome, where you, know, you get these gladiators out there just beating each other up. This one was for drama. This one was to, to put on plays and sing, 25,000 people. Uh, or even more impressive, the Temple of Artemis. There's a picture of what's left of the temple in your bulletin. That was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Uh, it, was, it was more beautiful than the ones you see in Athens and other places. So some say, um, in addition to all that, uh, well, what we are pretty sure of is Paul went there to found the church in about 52. He probably spent a couple of years there. So somewhere like 52 to 54, Paul was there in Ephesus founding a church with these people. Uh, after he visited, uh, we're pretty sure that John, as in Gospel of Exactly. It's so easy, isn't it? You're like Bible scholars. John showed up in Ephesus after Paul. We also know from the Bible that at the cross, John was charged with taking care of Jesus' mother, Mary. So it's very likely, and in fact, there's like a little tourist place there in Ephesus, uh, outside of Ephesus, where they think that Mary lived out the rest of her life. So she was, she was brought there. So that, that's Ephesus. In the, the book of Ephesians, um, you know, what does Paul say to people who are so smart? People who have figured out uh, mysteries of religion and of technology and of science. People uh, who are so important that kings and emperors and God's own mother uh, come to visit. How do you reach those great minds and bring them closer to holiness? Two ways that I've figured out how to reach great minds in, in my life. One, um, get over yourself. Uh, you might be fancy, but that doesn't make you special. Uh, second, if you're really that awesome, if you really are, if you're so great, then use that to do something good. Use that to do something great in the world. Uh, so one, Paul said it this way, uh, humility and service. Justine read it. A Presbyterians hold on to this uh, verse stronger than maybe any other denomination. You know, everyone has their emphasis in different Christianities. This is one for us. Um, Paul said, grace is a gift. It ain't anything that you did. It ain't anything that you earn. And you might think, you might even be the smartest and strongest and most beautiful and spiritual person in the whole world, and you might have done in your life so much to get there. You've overcome so many obstacles and won in so many ways. Good for you. Um, who breathed life and love into your heart? Because that wasn't you. That's grace. And you couldn't have done any of those things, uh, anything to earn that. 
without the miracle of a world coming down and set a world full of beauty, then what a miracle that we are designed to be able to see and experience that beauty. Or on the other hand, you might think that your world is the most ugliest. It might have been the hardest, most painful, most stressful in the world. And you wonder, how do I keep it all together? How, how can I keep, keep hope in the midst of so much? Well, you've made it this far. And the universe is shaped for you to encourage uh, yourself and to keep breathing. And there are people praying for you. And grace is the fact that no matter how dark it is in front of you, light exists somewhere. And you might find it. Amen? And grace is there for all of us. That message is perfect. But sometimes successful people really need to hear that more. Grace. So that's one. Um, there's a God. You ain't it. Uh, and two, uh, uh, Paul said, you've been given grace not just for yourself. This ain't just for you to, to, to experience and enjoy. Grace is there for your own goods first, and so you can give back and do good works second. Life is not about accumulating, but about giving back. Do you believe that? Okay, you're on, you're on board with Paul. So one, you are God's masterpiece because God painted you, not because you painted yourself. And two, you have been blessed to be a blessing. In college, um, we used to say that in Latin, which is so snooty, and sometimes we'd even do it while wearing capes, which is just beyond uh, compare. We would say benedictum benedictus, and that blessed to be a blessing, um, which I thought was ridiculous, but the people of Ephesus would have thought that was amazing. Netherlands isn't Ephesus, is it? Any kings here? <laughs> Emperors? Anyone give virgin birth to a god? No? Okay. Um, does anyone measure your neighbor by how good their Latin is? Uh, no, because, um, in, in which I probably uh, didn't conjugate the prayer to write anyway. So good. Um, Paul, or more likely it's Paul's follower who wrote this kind of in his name, uh, he was writing to fancy people. We aren't that fancy sitting in these pews. Some of us are absolutely impressive. When I came to interview at this church, and I've told the story several times, I had about a 0% chance of actually taking this job. I came here to practice interviewing for churches. You were, you were my like warm-up church, right? And I came here, and two things knocked me out. Um, one thing is the interview committee, um, they prayed well and differently, right? So one day Michael O'Neill would center himself and pray to the grand spirit of all cosmic coming together. And then Wes Steiffer would say, Father God, we just want you to do... And I was like, how can a church be with people like that that different and it, and it be so sincere? And two, it was a small church then, and so many people uh, were really impressive. So it was like, oh, this so-and-so here has a PhD and they work on like Mars stuff. And like this person testified before Congress on this kind of stuff. And this doctor over here does these special things. And I thought, book club will be amazing with these people. <laughs> And it was. Like, Book Club has been amazing with those people. I've learned so much from the Ephesus sort of folks. But so often, as well, I've just learned from us. And I've just learned from, from Netflix. I've learned from uh, Will back there, you know, how to love your kids and just not stop, right? Just, just not give up on your kids. I've learned from woman after woman after woman who have lost their husbands, and they keep the candle burning, and they keep praying, and they keep coming here helping their friend when something else goes wrong in their life. I've learned uh, from so many folks with a struggling kid on one side and dying parents on another side, and how in the world do you hold on to hope through all of that just normal, difficult life? I've learned from people who keep giving us a chance in this church after one thing falls apart after another. You keep committing yourself to this diverse, awkward, weird, beautiful, difficult, weird, um, I said that twice, uh, group of people. Uh, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. We are benedictum benedictus. We are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Susan Lutz once took offense when I said, uh, we were talking about this church, and she, she, was, she demanded that she was a pretty regular lady. Um, and I said, Susan, there's nothing regular. You're, you are a very unique, one-of-a-kind person. This church is full of unique people, and that's what makes this, this place uh, kind of tick. Um, and if, I was hoping Susan would be here so that I could uh, kind of pick on her about some stuff, but there are some special people with special lives, and they've done amazing things in, to, to shine their light into the world. So that's us. That's us. Ephesus is written to them, to a different group of people, to a different audience. How do we translate that message of grace and good works? How do we, he, he tailored it to some people. How do we do that for us, for our particular holy mess here? Well, the only way I can imagine doing that is um, we'll go on a thought experiment. Because the whole world's kind of messy. It's not just us. This is the, Outside these walls, there's a lot of crazy stuff out there we wish we could fix. 
And just imagine, what if God finally saw that and said, all right, it's time to send another testament. We got an old one, we got a new one, let's do another one. And the Bible has so many letters to individual church communities, so since this is a thought experiment, what if this 21st century prophet decided to write to us, 1st Netherlandians, chapter 1, verse 1. This is just my translation, um, so, you know, good news and grace. Uh, this is how it starts. Verse 1. Hey, y'all, don't you know that God loves you? And you know how to love each other, so do more of that. Amen? Yeah, it's starting well. Okay, so we're, we're on, on target. Verse 2. Uh, if you want to be a light to the darkness, uh, loving each other well, keep doing mission for your neighbors in need. Do you want to be a light to the darkness? Amen. Do you like the mission that we do here? Amen. All right, so we're going to keep this book is right up our head. It's almost like it's written to us. Verse 3. Keep open doors. Make open minds. Widen open hearts. Openness and welcoming is always a priority here. Uh, do you want it always to be a priority here? Yes. Okay, verse 4. If you want to be a light to the darkness, embody grace. Just as God has given you grace as a gift to keep moving your life toward the muck, toward joy, share that with others. Which sounds spiritual, because everyone can share. Everyone can be welcomed. Even the ones who have been welcomed can be welcomed. Welcoming. Verse 5. This is my totally made-up version of God's Word, which some people think is a sin, but, you know, deal with it. Uh, <laughs> grace here means sometimes you have to cut people some slack for the bad behavior that comes with messy people. Which we do better than any church I've ever been part of in my life. We do. We do that awesome. A lot of churches, they get... You know the, the thing that people get most upset about in most churches? It's, it's two things. One is um, the songs we sing, and two is when kids do make, make too much noise in the pews. So like the messiness of other churches, the biggest issues, three is, is kind of taboo, but it's like when people mess up the kitchen and like the church mothers just lose their mind. So those are the three big things that count as messiness in most churches. Um, but Jesus... He hung out with, and maybe this, this list is, is hard to kind of just wrap your head around, but I promise this is Jesus who we hang out with, and it's people uh, here too. Jesus hung out with really difficult young men, and a repentant tax cheat, and unrepentant drunks, and regular folks just desperately seeking holiness, and quiet, introverted saints, and guys who carried swords, and loud prostitutes, and super helpful church ladies, and some who came from different religious and ethnic backgrounds, and others who had contempt for those people. And I promise you, each one of those we've had sitting in these pews and call this a church home. Um, we've even lost people at this church because we're so welcoming at times. Uh, one of the weird uh, deals in this church, we had a guy many years ago who said one of these weird sentences that just kind of stick in your brain, and for years you're like, I don't know what that means. And then you start to figure out what that means. He told me, he said, Hanson, you do a lot of things like Christ, but this isn't church. And I thought, huh? But I'm starting to figure out that some people have a definition of church, and it only accepts a certain level of mess that Jesus went well beyond. So, um, hopefully, if you want to be like Jesus and love like Jesus, you find it in your room of your heart to be uncomfortable. Um, hopefully, you can find it in your room to help other people strive, and to be graceful to other people, so we can all do more good works and be a better uh, light for this community. Uh, but you know that. You knew I'd say that. Verse 6, embodying grace here also means, verily, verily, I say unto you, that some of you who are absolutely part of this community because you belong to us, some of you are invited to leave some of that bad behavior at home. Some of you are invited uh, to bless the whole community by helping others be comfortable on their spiritual journeys. Um, so, uh, is Milo part of our church? Ray, is Milo part of our church? Absolutely. That dog back there is absolutely part of our church. We, we make space for that dog and other dogs. If Milo decided, God forbid, it would never happen, but just, you know, this is a thought experiment. If Milo started peeing on the carpet and, like, biting people, Ray and I would have to have a conversation about Milo, right? It'd be fine. It'd be fine. She says it's fine, so, so maybe Hillary's level of acceptance is even higher. But, you know, we've had, we've had dogs that are rough around here, but Milo is a saint, thank God, so we keep Milo around. But if there's a problem, you have to deal with it. So, verse 7, in the spirit of God, from a place of love, you, Netherlandians, um, are striving to be the most welcoming church you can be. In the spirit of God, from a place of love, may you never forget to welcome the welcomers. 
by leaving some of the unwelcoming behavior back at home while you meet here in peace. Welcome the welcomers by leaving unwelcoming behavior back at home. Grace gets complicated when we're all supposed to embody it. Verse 8, peace is hard. Everyone has a role to play in that. And when it works for one simple hour, may that echo through the rest of your week and the rest of the community. So make this hour special. Make it special. When we all reach for grace, who knows how that will reveal itself in the good works that follow you. When we don't uh, honor this hour, think of the opportunities that we have missed to uh, embody a different sense of life and love. Verse 9. Aren't you glad God didn't write this? Because it's getting really invasive. Verse 9. Uh, Therefore, pastors... See, I told you, it's getting really invasive. Uh, pastors, hold on to grace and welcome people who need it most. And hold on to the boundaries for the good of all people who need grace, which is all people. An obvious confession, that's been hard for me, to hold on to the boundaries. Um, on one hand, theologically, I prioritize, I start always in the idea of welcoming the stranger, and we do that well. On the other hand, practically, I told uh, a string fellow back there, um, I don't have kids, so I don't have a lot of practice like holding people to certain expectations. You know, I, I've kind of failed at that, which sometimes has meant that the church, this church, has been hard for some of you at times. And when welcomers don't feel welcome uh, because of unwelcoming behavior, we can't do all the good works that we're called to do. So verse 10, grace and boundaries mean, you have heard it said, Jesus ministered to drunks, but I tell you, leave the hooch at home. Jesus came to heal the sick, which is more than being their friend. And people with all kinds of addictions are absolutely welcome here. The people are welcome here, and you can welcome and love others by carving out this hour as an effort for healing. Verse 11, grace and boundaries mean, you have heard it said, Jesus told Peter to put down the sword, and I tell you, come on. I hate guns. I mean, I hate guns. I probably hate guns. Like cigarettes, I really hate guns. I hate even more. Fran, do I hate guns? Yes, you hate I hate guns. <laughs> Um, and I hate the ridiculous extremes people go to defend guns at all places. Uh, but we don't have a policy on guns. We don't have a policy on weapons. We do have a policy on locking the back door because sometimes our children have felt unsafe. Do you want our children to feel unsafe? No. Do you want to feel unsafe? No. no. So, um, which means if, if you have a need for self-defense and whatever that means, like, I want to take a crop my God. These are some weapons now, let me tell you. I mean, I can get beat up a little bit less than I could before. Um, but if you need a self-defense, okay, fine. But let's have the grace of understanding that there's a line between your feeling of safety and others' feeling of safety. So just the weapons, they, they don't need to come out. Verse 12, grace and boundaries mean, you have heard it said, God helps those who help themselves. But I tell you, that was actually Ben Franklin. That wasn't God. And God calls us to help each other, no matter what. And sometimes that help means... Uh, sometimes help means take your meds. Sometimes help means go to your therapist. Sometimes help means let's calm down together. Sometimes help means let's take a break. Uh, community and meaningful purpose are absolutely vital to everyone's mental health. You understand? I don't care how sane you are or how crazy you are. If you don't have a community of people and a meaningful purpose in your life, you are not going to thrive. You're going to struggle. But when mental illness affects a community experience and meaningful purpose of other people, that gets hard. This week, I had the very pleasant experience of working with a counselor and the police to complete the very unpleasant experience of sending one of our members into a mental health hole, <coughs> sending him to the hospital, uh, forcing him to the hospital. And that was hard to do. And it was invasive, and it might damage trust, and there's chances are when he gets out, if he gets out, he might hate the church. He might hate all churches forever for, you know, breaching that uh, line. But God, it's the only way to love this young man. The only way to do it is to set some boundaries. I told one of our church leaders about what had happened. I was, I just, probably because I was just kind of still in some shaky shock kind of thing. And she said, she said, uh, oh, is it so-and-so? <laughs> and I said, no. And she said, oh, is it the other one over there? No, it wasn't them either. Stop guessing. Um, life lesson number one, never ask a woman if she's pregnant. Learned it the hard way. Uh, life lesson number two, like, <laughs> never guess who had to go to the hospital. Um, life lesson number three, we're the ones who help people when they won't help themselves. 
Sometimes we're the only ones who can love people in that way, which is sometimes means boundaries, sometimes means hard conversations. Uh, two more. Verse 13. Um, grace and boundaries mean, you have heard it said to bear each other with patience and love, but I tell you, if your political ideology makes someone else feel threatened because you're a racist or a sexist or just a general jerk, and you hide behind and agree to disagree, or you make an idol out of hurtful and harmful lies, pray that your pastor has a really difficult discussion with you before God does. Amen. See, I, I, all of these, all of these, you might know one or two of these over the last six or eight months, all these have affected people in this church in really hard ways. And I know that people have been saying amongst themselves, and some of you have been courageous enough just to come and tell me, uh, you love your church. And it's been a little extra messy. So you want me to set some boundaries, which is fair enough. Because to be welcoming to all, we need a fully welcoming environment, which means a fully welcoming environment, which means I am not drawing lines between this inappropriate behavior and that inappropriate behavior. Frankly, I'm less scared of some of these things than others. Frankly, some of these things have hurt people more than others. But what it is, is that we need to feel together. We need to all experience and express grace. So, chapter ends, verse 14. Grace and boundaries mean, you have heard it said that pastors are supposed to be perfect, but I tell you, no. Nope. <laughs> the reason we had Paul come up here first is so you could be just kind of seated with the idea that we will disappoint each other. I will disappoint you. I have disappointed you. Uh, some of you get pretty steamy when I disappoint you in certain ways. Well, leadership is about disappointing people at a rate they can accept. Hopefully, my rate of disappointment, I get lower and lower, but it's never going to stop. And I'm never going to get it just right. And so I always need your help to do that. So thank you for those who have helped me be a better spiritual leader. Um, uh, thank you for whoever helped me with the fallout from this sermon. Um, and I invite others, whenever things happen, come and talk to me. When I first got here six years plus, I literally left that door open every time I was in the office because it was a symbol of openness. I don't do that anymore because I can't get any work done, um, but it's always available. Just come in and bug me. If I need to kick you out, I'll kick you out. But this is a place of open doors, open minds, open hearts. Uh, Every job is hard in different ways. I'm going to close with the story of what happened like my third Sunday here. This week's first is my first Sunday doing communion. And so I, I had, you know, I don't, you, you know how I do communion now. It's a little loosey goosey, right? It's a little different every time. I use different language every time. That day, I did use some of the, the formal language from the Episcopal Church. I, and it's a little loosey goosey, and then I had this back and forth formal language. And someone came up to me after the service and said, Thank you for that. It was, it was beautiful. It resonated with my childhood. It resonated with my heart. It was, it was ritual. You know, just that little part just made me feel so home. And I said, thank you. Remind me of your name, because I don't know you. Mm -hmm. Next person comes up and says, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> you treated it so common. I will never come back here again. Uh, that, I mean, that's an extreme example, but it happens every month. At, last week, Thank you for this. Oh my God! And I, you know, I, I didn't know where to go, and I, I didn't really pay attention to this as much as I should have. Um, but it, it happens here all the time. I could try to make everyone happy. No, I couldn't. I'm not polite enough. I'm not nice enough. I could never do. It. Um, I could try to avoid difficult topics, but I couldn't do that either. I really couldn't be successful at that. As I told our, our board of kind of leaders, our spiritual leaders, this section of this church. Um, um, the thing I value probably most about this job is the ability to have integrity in what I do. Spiritual integrity. My sense of how God is calling me to say what I'm called to say. Uh, over and over and over in this church, things happen, things are said, I do things. It just couldn't happen in other churches. It just couldn't. So I thank you for that. I can't avoid difficult topics because Jesus didn't. Uh, so I can aim to make this a more welcoming place for all people by uh, defining all as all by urging all of you to be more welcoming to your neighbors so that we can do good work. And I ask your forgiveness when I fail. And I ask your partnership to keep pointing us toward being a beloved community of God. And I ask you to hold me accountable to that. Amen?